Hey, y'all. Thanks for sticking around this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Pat, for coming out. Um, there are any number of things that we can talk about, but I think the first thing to talk about is really why you're doing this. You had an incredibly successful career as a geneticist and a professor at Stanford, and now you are taking on the meat industry. Why? Uh, pretty simple. I mean, I, I about 10 years ago, uh, when I was trying to figure out what, what I could do next that would have the biggest positive impact on the world, I very quickly uh, realized that by far the most destructive technology and the most destructive industry on Earth uh, is the use of animals as a food production technology. And um, I was, in retrospect, kind of embarrassed that I didn't already realize this, but um, at the time, the UN Environmental Program had actually already published a monograph that came to that conclusion. And at this point, I would say there's probably a significant majority of all envir environmental scientists would say the exact same thing. This is by far the most destructive technology on Earth. Um, huge source of greenhouse gas emissions, biggest user of water of any industry on Earth, biggest polluter of water by far of any industry on Earth, um, occupies a land footprint that's uh, approximately half of Earth's entire land area, bigger than North America, South America, Europe, and Australia combined, land actively in use every year, raising animals for food, at a tremendous cost to biodiversity. Um, it is overwhelmingly the biggest and virtually the only driver of a catastrophic meltdown biodiversity that we're experiencing right now, where um, the total number of living individuals of, of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, and probably insects as well, is less than half today what it was 40 years ago. In fact, it's about 60% lower total number of living wild animals on Earth compared to just 40 years ago. And if you read the World Wildlife Fund report on that, it's very clear that it's virtually entirely due to our use of animals in the food system. But the problem but, was, I just want to say one more thing, the problem was that people are not going to stop wanting to eat these foods. So right. you're wasting your time if you're trying to get people to change their diets. And that meant you had to figure out a way to make uh, foods that delivered everything those consumers want. There was an article in the New York Times today uh, where someone was talking about uh, the meat industry and an expert was quoted as saying, if everyone gave up hamburgers tomorrow, the same number of cows would still be raised and fed. So why start with ground beef if ground beef really isn't sort of the driver of why people are, con or, or what people are actually sort of consuming meat for? Well, I didn't read the, read the article, but um, I, I'm surprised by that conclusion because um, uh, more than half of all the beef produced in the U.S. Uh, today is sold as ground beef. Um, so, and about 25% of the beef um, produced in the U.S. can't be sold in any form other than ground beef because it's basically too unappealing as a, as right. a whole cut. So, in fact, um, uh, ground, meat, be ground beef sales are a very important component of the business model of the beef industry. And the goal that we have is to um, reduce and eliminate the economic incentive for covering the entire friggin' planet with cows. Right now there's 10 times more cow biomass on Earth than the total biomass of every wild land vertebrate that's still alive. So this is what we're doing right now. Our goal is to basically eliminate the economic incentive to do that anymore, to keep tearing down the Amazon to create more room for growing cows because demand goes up, the earth's not getting any bigger. The only way to produce more cows is to deforest the Amazon. So that smoke you see coming out of the Amazon is the secondhand smoke from your burger. I'm, uh, I think this is a, a, a very good strategy. And I would even say that because the beef industry has, has pretty crappy economics, I don't think it, it requires a huge amount of disruption to, to, um, to their business and to their economics uh, to significantly reduce the incentive to keep growing the cow herd size. Well, but uh, the issue there is that b ground beef is very, very cheap as well. Can you compete on a cost basis with this stuff at some point, and how do you do that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think the, the, the starting point is to realize that the, the, there's a structural advantage to the way that we're doing this. And it's represented in the fact that, you know, for us to produce a burger, and we have uh, a publicly available audit to LCA on this, um, requires a low single-digit fraction of the land area, like 
considerably less than a 25th of the land area to produce a cow, um, about an eighth the water input, one twelfth the fertilizer input, and substantially because you're, you, you need so much less land and water and, and so much less resources, also less labor input. Okay, well what that means is that the, the fundamental economics are vastly superior. The, the only thing we don't have that they have is scale and a pre-existing infrastructure. But at scale, there's just no question that but, we're going to But that, I mean, that's a pretty big benefit for the industry. Like, how much, does, uh, how much does it cost you to make an impossible, ground impossible meat versus the same size of, of burger meat? Well, I can't give you the exact data because it's, it's kind of confidential information. I mean, I would, but my CFO would kill me. So, <laughs> um, the, but I can say that basically, you know, our product is being sold in, in lots of mass market uh, places, Burger King, White Castle, Fat Burger, tons of these burger chains that sell their burgers at, at, uh, at a price that's affordable to mainstream consumers. It's great for their business. They're, they're, it's hugely profitable for them. And um, it, it's, we're not losing money on those sales either. So you can draw your own conclusions, but basically, and we're at a very early stage. You know, three years ago, we, we were operating out of effectively a garage. Right. And so um, we've gotten our economics to the point where we're competing in this mass market, you know, uh, low cost burger market. Right. And we've at only at a very early stage in bring, you know, bringing our costs optimizing our costs. Speaking of fast food, um, earlier this week on Monday, uh, McDonald's launched their pilot test with the PLT, the plant lettuce tomato mm -hmm. burger, using Beyond Meats um, stuff. Um, does that preclude you now from selling to McDonald's or, or how does that, oh, that no. sort of pitch work with... Uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about like the, the, the dynamics of that business, but I, I guess what I'll say is the way that we think about this problem, first of all, is the only com competitor we care about is the incumbent industry, um, and, uh, which right now owns 99% of the market. You know, all the plant-based producers put together are like 1%. Um, so it'd be ridiculous for us to be trying to, to compete in that space. But secondly, um, the way that we think about this is that our whole focus is on just making awesome products that don't just, that it, we're not trying to outperform veggie burgers, we're trying to outperform the cow. And if we focus on that and, and produce the most delicious, healthiest, um, uh, affordable ground beef on the market, mm. uh, I don't think we're going to have to beg McDonald's or anyone else to, um, you know, to, to put it on their menu. Right. Speaking of uh, the, the product portfolio, I was in your offices yesterday and I tried some of the fried chicken that y'all were working on out there. Um, I was wondering, when you think about the product portfolio and what comes next, where, how do you make that calculus about what, what the roadmap should look like given how much demand you have for the, um, the ground meat substitute right now? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. I mean, it's a multidimensional optimization problem. First of all, we, we, we are trying to choose products. Our goal is to you know, solve the biggest environmental problem that our plant has ever faced, which is the catastrophic impact of this industry. And so that requires us, um, first of all, to be able to make any product that is, is, is currently um, providing economic incentive for this c catastrophe. Um, but we also you know, chose beef deliberately because Beef production is by far uh, uh, has by far the most destructive impact on the environment. Um, that's why we're we're pushing on that right now. Uh, meanwhile, our future is in our R and D operation. Basically, what determines our success, like I say, is not you know we have awesome teams, sales, marketing, finance, every aspect of the business, and we have to be great at manufacturing all those things. But ultimately, it comes down to we have to make products that consumers prefer to the products that come from animals for the, for the purposes for which they're currently using the animal products. So it has to, in that niche, do a better job. And that's only going to come from R&D. And that's why we have, you know, we have 120 people on our R&D team. We're going to approximately double it. And these are some of the best scientists in the world. Because this is a really hard problem, and it's so high stakes. Um, but um, we want to have that the, the, the know-how and the, the technology platform to be able to make this in, entire gamut of yeah. products. And then it comes down to other, other factors that just includes you know, our bandwidth for, for 
scaling manufacturing and, uh, and just scaling the team and so forth. What's um, the thorniest problem that the R&D team is wrestling with right now? Wow. Um, well, I guess what, what I'll say is that, um, you know, we figured out, I would say, like 95% of the flavor chemistry of, of meat and animal tissues relatively early on. And a lot of it comes down to, you know, heme right. as the catalyst that converts these simple precursors, amino acids, sugars, and vitamins and stuff like that into this unique explosion of aroma with meat and the bloody flavor and all that stuff. Um, uh, but there's still a ton to learn there too about, because we don't want to just make something that, you know, is a good version of beef flavor. We want to figure out what's the absolute pinnacle mm -hmm. that we can deliver that outperforms anything a cow can do right. and, and a bunch of other stuff. So there's tons more work there. Um, we, we are looking at, um, and then texture is a whole other issue, and it's, it's equally challenging. And we have a lot of people working on, on you know, developing uh, materials that are sust from sustainable plant sources that have a great nutrition profile and, and um, have the physical properties and, you know, juiciness, texture, asymmetry and stuff like that of all these animal tissues. That's a hard challenge. That's a very material science challenge that's, that's very hard. And when you say juiciness and texture, is that trying to get at something that approximates like a muscle meat, like more like a cut of steak? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've made steak prototypes. We're not any, you know, not near scaling them, but, but ultimately that's something I think for us, to, for us to really take away the economic incentive for growing cows, we definitely have to have something that, that uh, can compete against cow-derived steak well, so that's, that's, but there's a ton of these problems right. uh, to solve, and, 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 and the fact is, they're all hard. <laughs> and then there's, um, but they're all solvable. Right. That, I knew that when I started, and I know it even more firmly now, that these are hard problems, and they're solvable problems. And we're also looking at our supply chain. Like, we, we, our goal, if, if we're successful in, you know, 10, 15 years, um, uh, we will be responsible for a substantial fraction of the world's, or not our impossible foods, but us and the people we enable, to uh, food supply, which means we have to really think about food security. We have to think about what plants should we get proteins from and, and how do we optimize, how do we create a, a system that is optimized for food security, optimized right. for you know, uh, thinking about community scale and stuff like that. And we have work going on on that because that's such a long lead time. We need to be working on that now. There, so there was a lot to unpack in that answer. Um, and there are sort of three things that I'd like to touch on. Um, you mentioned nutrition, making a product that's more nutritious. Every time I asked someone or told someone that I was going to be talking to you, they wanted me to ask you about how, whether the product is, is healthier than, um, than a beef burger, and, and the, the push now is that it's not healthier at all than a beef burger. So what is, the, how, do you, how do you respond to criticism about the fact that the Impossible Burger is not good for you? Well, um, we basically make all our nutrition information and everything we know about our ingredients freely available to anyone on our website and, and you know, answer any questions about it, and then you can decide for yourself. But I would say that um, one of our core principles is that we are never going to sell a product unless we have critically reviewed all the data and believe that it is better for the consumer than what it replaces. We are not making health claims for the product, but we internally have a very high standard for that. So our product has um, uh, matches the protein matches and actually slightly exceeds the protein quality in terms of the digestibility and amino acid content of a cow burger. It's lower calorie, it's lower fat, it's lower saturated fat. Uh, it has the same iron, it has the same bioavailable iron, the kind of iron that, that red meat has that makes it appealing for people who you know, uh, need, need a good iron source. It has the same micronutrient profile um, and, uh, and we're constantly optimizing that. So, I mean, consumers have to decide for ourselves, but, but um, I, I can, you know, uh, say with confidence 
that this product uh, is, is, someone who's currently eating the cow product uh, is no worse off eating our product and, and in many ways better off. And the thing to keep in mind also is that we're not trying to make the, the food to fulfill all your dietary needs in one burger. We're trying to make a product that, that will be better for the consumer in that niche in which a burger occupies, which will not be replaced by a kale salad or, um, you know, uh, whatever. It's, right. it's, it, it, it does a better job of delivering nutrition to the consumer for a product that has to perform as a burger. Now, you, you've also said that, that um, you've talked about the need to scale dramatically on the supply chain side. You're adding more R&D folks. Um, and you've also said that you plan to take a double-digit portion of the beef market within five years and then push that industry into a death spiral. Um, it seems like you would need a lot of cash to do that. Um, the other thing is, I, 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 so does the next financing event come from a public offering? Are you looking to IPO? Is that going to happen soon? Or how, how do you get the money to, do these, to achieve these goals? Well, first of all, you're right. It's... it's, it's you know, a hugely ambitious goal. Um, it, it will require a lot of resources and so forth. Um, and we'll have to get those resources either from investors or from getting our um, profit margins to the point where we can scale at the velocity that we want to scale um, with the profits we make from our business, which we, it'll be a while before we're at that point. So we'll definitely have to raise more money. I would say we are, are not looking in the near-term future toward an IPO. Um, as anyone here probably knows, there's a lot of complications that come with that. We have our hands full growing our business, um, doing our core job, um, and we have great investors, and we have uh, um, a lot of private investors who are willing to, to bet on us and so forth. So at this point, it's not, it's not something that we need and, uh, and we can just take our time about it, basically. Mm. And so when you think about what comes next uh, on the product roadmap, if you look out five years, what does the Impossible Foods product portfolio look like? Um, I'm not being evasive because, you know, uh, there, that's, that's a very complicated question, and it depends on a lot of things that, that you know, uh, how things proceed in the future. Um, we're building, you know, in the R&D space, we're building the capability um, and, and, you know, um, advanced prototypes for, for a lot of products that would compete in that space. But the, the, the thing about scaling right now is that, you know, scaling manufacturing is no, it's, it's a big deal. Um, it's totally different from scaling an app or something like that. Like you have to, you have to, right now, if, if, we, if we believe, as we do, that our, our sales are going to be, you know, like 10 times what they are today in, in you know, uh, 18 months or, or so, that means that, that we have to be investing right now to grow our manufacturing and supply chain, not just a little, but by a lot. Okay, that's just kind of, uh, uh, that's a huge challenge just for our existing product where we have very strong demand signals that, that would justify, justify that. And... And being a small company, um, uh, you know, we, we need to focus on doing that really well. Um, and when we have more resources, I think, you know, being able to launch new products, we want to have them all ready in, 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 in R&D. Um, so when the opportunity arises and we have the resources or when there's, you know, a huge market opportunity uh, uh, that, that, you know, justifies it, we're ready to go. Would it not make sense if that's the goal to, to work with the traditional meat industry? They have a bunch of money. They have a bunch of infrastructure. They know how to scale. They have a logistics supply chain that's already worked out. If, if a company like that was to make a credible offer to acquire you or any company that's got scale, you know, massive amounts of money, w would that not be a more effective route? Well, first of all, in terms of being acquired, I mean, uh, let's put it this way. We're, we're not going to let ourselves be acquired by anyone who we don't believe is as firmly committed to our mission as we are. And so far, we haven't seen anyone who meets that, that, that description and, and is willing to put all the same resources into this that we would go after and get. 
right now, I would say absolutely the current players in the meat industry don't even come close to meeting that bar. So, so uh, um, that's not of interest. They have way too much to lose from our success. Uh, um, and um, I don't think they, they wish us well. Um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, working with people who are connected to that industry, well, we, we just uh, entered into a partnership with actually the manufacturer that I think is responsible for producing most of McDonald's you know, beef burgers. Um, they're a large fraction of their business is, is um, serving the you know, animal-based meat market. But the interesting thing is that their, their technology and their business model is agnostic. So in other words, it's not, it's not like our success would, would, would come at the expense of some other part of this, the business. So we look at that differently, basically. We don't want to put our, hands, uh, our fate in the hands of someone who has any kind of conflict about our success. Right. But if it's someone who's engaged in the food industry and the meat industry or whatever, um, but where there is no such conflict, like it's all upside for them and therefore they have no incentive to put risk on us, right. uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, we are out of time. I could talk to you all afternoon about this stuff. It's fascinating. I really appreciate it, sir. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>